I believe it is. We're, we're having really good results. Okay, so it's 8 p.m. on um, on the west coast of the United States. It's about 2 p.m. Uh, in some parts of Australia where we're, where we're receiving visitors. Welcome to um, Art World Australia. It's being presented by uh, BG Gallery, um, which is in Santa Monica near my my studio, and it's and uh, I am Yuri Yuri Cole from the Venice Institute of Contemporary Art. The owner and founder of the BG Gallery is Om uh, Bleicher, who's sitting Good evening. here. Good evening. Good afternoon. Um, so the, we have three guests, um, plus um, well more than three guests, but we have three guests we're going to talk to first, and then we're going to. Uh, do some studio visits at the end uh, with some artists who are going to show us some of their work. So the first, uh, the, I'm going to go through the, the guests first, and then we'll start with the first guest. The first guest is Roan. He's a street artist um, and a photographer who um, often does uh, uh, portraits of uh, the female uh, face. Um, they're gorgeous and very large and wonderful. Uh, the second guest will be Alex, Alec Graham from the Art Gallery in New South Wales, who will share work by Brett Whitley and others. Whitley. Whitley, sorry. And then we have Charles Justin from JAM, he calls it, but it's also known as the, Je the Justin Art House Museum. He's been doing some art travels of late, which he is starting to put on his website, and so it's it's fairly, it's interesting that, uh, I believe that's Jam, yep, there's Jam. And um, we're gonna be showing pictures of Australia uh, as uh, we go through the beginning of this discussion. Here we have Roan's, uh, one of Roan's works. Roan, um, your, I saw the video of your uh, portraits and of you doing the portraits. And one thing that's interesting is a couple of projects you've done, pardon me, where your um, images are painted on buildings that are about to be removed and replaced for other uses. And I really, really enjoyed watching the video of you doing that on, on some buildings that were part of a new project. Um, and the reason I like them is because um, besides their beauty and, and their, they're all uh, faces that are the, 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 the jaw is tilted up to the sky, people are looking upward or off into a distant place. Um, but what I really found interesting is that you, um, that you use a, uh, uh, an industrial spray, um, spray machine to spray the paint. And it looked to me like you didn't do any cartoons. We call them cartoons when we do frescoes. So why don't you talk about your um, those murals, and then that can segue to 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 whatever to any other questions we might have. Yeah, I um, I guess uh, by cartoons you might mean a sketch of how I, how yeah. I begin. Yeah, work. Something yeah, you put on, something you put on the wall first. It looks like you're yeah. doing it freehand. Yeah, I, I am doing it freehand. I actually, I cut this whole section out of my presentation um, because it's quite a long and involved technique that I developed. Um, you know, like everyone knows the idea of doing the, the grid technique where you sure. put like, you know, the squares yeah. over yeah. the image you want to reference. Um, after doing that on such a large scale, it's really impractical once you get over, you know, two or three stories. Um, because you need to have it like multiple yeah. cherry pickers and lines and walls aren't actually level. So I developed this system where I just put all sorts of random markings across the whole wall. Or if the wall has an interesting texture, um, that's enough. And I'll use the texture or the random markings as reference points. Like for the so edge take of the a photograph. Person? Yeah. Yeah. yeah so cool. I can just take a photograph, overlay it, and then um, use that as my reference point and then I no longer do I need to ever step back and like I'm confident in the technique and I just know my proportions are going to be perfect because of it um, that's fantastic and it's I've shared this with a lot of other artists and I just did a uh, something like this last week with um, a, a couple hundred teachers from Australia trying to teach them how to do it so they can pass it on to their students as well 
Yeah, I think I think we could um, we I think I'd like to introduce some of my muralist friends in LA that technique yeah. because when I saw you do it, I was like that frees up a huge amount of time. Yeah, yeah, it does. Um, and it, it's, and it's, so many mistakes are made because you've you start in the wrong square. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and it allow it seems like it allows you to um, to uh, do works quicker, but still just as accurate. Which means that if you're working in buildings that might be torn down imminently, you have a chance to do yeah. something in that space quickly. Relatively yeah, quickly. Yeah, it actually allows you to work on surfaces that aren't flat as well. So right. you can take a photo of something and, and it can actually have like a step in the wall or be on a 45 degree angle in part of it. And you know where you're taking your photo from, it's gonna look right from that perspective. So do you, um, so tell, tell us about uh, what's going on with you right now, are you, in process of certain murals? Do you have more other subjects you want to tackle? Every, everything's canceled. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, so the last couple of years, my work's kind of moved into this uh, immersive art realm where I build these um, quite over the top sets inside these buildings that people can come and visit and walk through and they have like an entire soundscape and everything um but that is not quite possible in today's current climate um so all the programs i had lined up for this year have been you know pushed back to next year um one thing i've survived on and this is kind of funny is um jigsaw puzzles i've started selling jigsaw puzzles of my artwork and I did it like the moment we went into lockdown, I just had to offer them <laughs> and it's been like eight months and I'm still selling them. And like, it's been one of those things where like, I, I like, oh, I might sell 20 of them. And I've sold like over a thousand. I've literally <laughs> made, made my income this year from jigsaw puzzles. Mm -hmm. And it's like, I don't know how the hell that happened. Um, That's fantastic. That's yeah. fantastic. So it's, it's a very quick pivot there. Uh, are those yeah. are those uh, jigsaw puzzle? Well, I'm gonna have to check it out on your website. So yeah, it's all um, So um, well, thank you. Um, I'm gonna um, uh, move on quickly. We're gonna come back to you, yeah. Ron, if you're still For here. Sure. Um, but I'm gonna move qu move quickly to Alex Graham at the Art Gallery of New South Wales, and you're showing work by Brett Whiteley at, and other Australian artists. Um, tell us a little bit about your gallery. How long it's been in? operation and what the, how you've dealt with the struggles of COVID. Uh, thanks, the, Yuri. Um, the Brett Whiteley studio uh, is dedicated to the artist Brett Whiteley, who uh, throughout the 60s, 70s, 80s, uh, made an international career for himself as a painter primarily. He was uh, 22 years of age when he sold works to the Tate Gallery in London and, and was acquired into their collection. So uh, very early on, he was showing with Bridget Riley and um, uh, a number of major artists uh, that were emerging in the 60s in London. He was represented by Marlborough Gallery that was showing Francis Bacon's works and became good friends with Francis Bacon. Uh, so had he stayed in Europe and America, he would have... Um, no doubt had an international career, uh, but uh, decided to come back to Australia and, and raise his family here. He had a young family at the time. And the studio itself in Surrey Hills in Sydney was his last uh, studio and residence. It's, um, it's a split level warehouse. It has a mezzanine with his uh, purpose-built studio in it. Um, so it's a museum, but it's also an art gallery. We have changing exhibitions of uh, Brett Whiteley's own artworks and we also have um, a, an annual uh, scholarship prize which is awarded to young Australian painters between the age of 20 and 30 and so we have a contemporary painter each year judge that award and first prize uh, is usually a trip to Paris um, for three months and three months to travel anywhere in Europe. Uh, we had to lock down with COVID as everybody else did um, so we just sort of pivoted and did some um, much needed renovations at that time and refreshed our walls and repainted and reinforced a few walls that needed a bit of TLC. And then uh, I had to cancel a show that we had planned with loans that were to come from interstate and reopen with uh, a collection exhibition at that time. 
Um, the studio uh, is an extraordinary place. It's unique. Uh, there aren't too many artist studios in Australia. It's supported by the government. So uh, we have some uh, sponsorship. Uh, we have uh, free admission because of uh, JP Morgan sponsorship, which is fantastic. Uh, the Art Gallery of New South Wales is a state government uh, institution. It's been around for uh, over 150 plus years and the studio has been running as a public museum since 1995 now. Brett Whiteley died in 92 and the family and the state government and the Art Gallery of New South Wales came to this arrangement. So. We've been running since 95. It's been free for the last uh, 15 years, which is as art gallery should be. Um, and it's a public museum. And so you have you been involved with it in that whole length of time or have you? I started off uh, Yuri as a teacher lecturer at the Art Gallery of New South Wales. So we were teaching visiting uh, students, um, uh, secondary and tertiary students about our own indigenous collections, uh, international artists, uh, changing exhibitions, etc. And um, working at the Brett Whiteley studio, it's a, a very much a deep dive. It's a specialist area. And you're looking at one artist's life, uh, their themes, their works, etc. So uh, I began after about two or three years at the Art Gallery of New South Wales teaching over at the Brett Whiteley studio. And um, I've stayed on and now manage the studio. Oh, that's fantastic. Um, how is, um, do we have uh, images of Brett Whiteley's work, uh, Laura? Yes, I can. Yep. Or you can show us yeah. if you have yeah. something nearby. Well, each, each panelist will be uh, giving us a, a little tour for, of images. Like us to do that but... now? Yeah, yeah, let's do it now. Okay. I'll get it up now. I think that's the way to do it. Let me see. Brian, there's uh, uh, there is it. Can you see it? Oh yeah, I see it. Yeah, and okay. Ron, Ron, if you want to get some of your images ready for in a few minutes, in a in a moment, that would be great. So, if you have some, uh, or Laura just, will have some. Anyway, go I was ahead. just going to ask him uh, what, whether uh, uh, Whiteley was uh, uh, an influence or any 20th century Aussie artists uh, had been an influence on his work, it's a different tradition, but. Um, uh, um, yeah, it's strange, like the, I really didn't have a lot of, um, you know, traditional art influence. Like I very much came from uh, painting in the street and skateboarding background. And uh, I've learned a lot about art recently, but it's like, yeah, growing up I was quite ignorant to stuff unless it was kind of pop culture. So sure. like, I know who Brett Whiteley is now, but it's like, when I started, I definitely didn't. Absolutely. Yeah, so we're looking now at the uh, Alex um, gallery um, or and, and some some art by um, Brett. Yeah, Brett Whiteley. yeah he's, he's uh, uh, well, I'll let Alex uh, take it from me a bit. <laughs> Thanks all. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, Whiteley's very well known for these Lavender Bay works in Australia. He's far better known uh, in Europe for his abstractions and early bathroom series um, and, and quite beautiful figurative works that he was doing uh, in his early 20s. When he comes back to Australia in the 70s, the Lavender Bay works uh, become uh, what he's renowned for in Australia. But he was a, a painter and a sculptor. This is the uh, living room upstairs in the studio. And um, the, these are the studio doors that enter into uh, his workspace, his creative workspace. So I just sort of wanted to sort of take you into the into the space physically. It's quite a, a an intimate uh, area. You go from a very public space downstairs uh, to a domestic space into quite a, an intimate working space. All the works that you see on the walls will change with each exhibition. Uh, we'll refresh and restage the studio as it is uh, with each uh, show. So we have about two to three exhibitions a year. So I wanted just to show you the dynamic space rather than a static space that we have. It's a combination of uh, preservation of what is Whiteley's works and uh, ephemeral materials, books, paint materials, uh, the graffiti on the wall, etc. But it's also a dynamic space for the exhibitions that we change and hold here. 
So that's this is very our interesting. Team. So you're curating uh, new artworks within the studio environment as though it's in situ um, in, in his studio. That, that's a very interesting way to do it. This is quite a unique thing on that Brett Whiteley, in fact, designed the space that you can see now for his own exhibitions. And he mm -hmm. lived upstairs from this. And mm -hmm. so he was a very holistic artist, an incredibly professional and successful artist. And now he was in complete control in terms of lighting his own artworks, curating his own exhibition, uh, pro you know, providing an exhibition catalogue and selling works to an established collection of um, uh, interested uh, um, buyers in, in, in Brett Whiteley's own artworks. So this was wow. the culmination of 30 years of art experience. Yeah, that's really unique. That's a unique way of doing it. I mean, although we, I've, 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 I've seen um, many artists have studios with exhibition locations within them. I've never mm -hmm. heard, heard of an artist devoting this amount of time to something this, this gorgeous in terms of uh, ability to showcase their own work, which is really a mark of somebody who sounds to me like realized he needed to do it because of uh, oh, the remoteness. Well, it's not remote, but you know what I, I think you understand what I mean. He was, a, he was a big fish in a small pond if you're looking at the art world, uh, Yuri. Um, but he started off as a, a pretty good fish swimming in a, a very large pond in Europe and America. Um, he, he was in major collections by the time he was 26, 27 throughout Europe and America. It, it's uh, extraordinary. How career he had had he stayed in uh europe or america he'd be as well known as david hockney that doesn't surprise me um how long did he live how 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 he died the... at the age of 53 mm. wow so that's the yeah. tragedy of his life he was a, a her heroin addict from his mid-30s so for about 20 years of his life the latter 20 years mm. and um that's the tragedy of Brett Whiteley. Uh, we, we're very fortunate that uh, his widow, Wendy Whiteley, um, is a great supporter of the Brett Whiteley studio. So uh, she in fact curates the exhibitions with us. And we have a number of uh, short films and videos on our website uh, with Wendy talking about uh, each exhibition and there's audio tools that we uh, have as guided tours that people can um, uh, click on to when they come to the studio and uh, listen to Wendy actually talking about the works, which is fantastic. Yeah, I think I'm going to have to spend some time with this. This is pretty incredible. Um, thank you very much for that um, and all the you're hard welcome. work you've been doing. Um, the next person we're going to introduce is Charles Justin for JAM, which is otherwise known as the Justin Art House Museum. Uh, we talked earlier and it's in Melbourne, um, Australia. And we also talked earlier about, go ahead, Om, what were you going to say? Oh, uh, I know Roan has a 2.30. Uh, I, I'm just wondering. Oh, Roan, let's see a few, let's see some of your works. Uh, Laura, can we put some of Roan's works up in, before we go to Justin? Uh, I can, um, yeah, yeah, you I can, can probably be like 15 yeah. minutes late. So go ahead. Yeah, yeah. but oh, no. Okay, uh, okay, okay. Let's, let's continue with Charles then. So Charles, tell us a little bit about how the, the Justin Art House Museum began, and uh, and tell us a little about a little bit about your travels and uh, the kind of work that you do at the at your museum. Um, well, the uh, I'm an architect by profession, and um, and I knew that I was retiring at 65 for my own practice, and um, so essentially the museum came about uh, because we were art collectors as well as. Um, something to do in our third stage of our life. So uh, my wife and I decided to go down that path. So we built um, the house museum and um, jumped oh, wow. in the deep end and um, decided to share our love of art with the public. And how long has it been open? Uh, we opened in 2016. Ah, and um, Laura, can you show the picture of the building again? And do we have some interiors of it? Uh, Yes, yes, sir. Uh, Charles will be sharing some images. Okay, great, Charles. Yeah, okay, great. I think it's very interesting because um, uh, quite often these private museums, uh, they get an architect to design it, but you were an architect yourself. So 
Um, yeah, but I, did, I didn't design it. My daughter did. Oh, you didn't? Oh. My daughter's an architect, uh, oh. and um, so I gave the project to her, and uh, she oh. did a much better job than I would have done. Beautiful. Um, That's gorgeous. So, um, yeah, so um, so yeah. We, we're, we're very interested in private museums, and in fact, uh, the last uh, 10, 10 years we've been um, searching out uh, private museums around the world when we travel, and... Um, and one of the interesting things about private museums is that they are all unique. Each one is different. And, and that's what's so fascinating about them because uh, you see the uh, personal sort of interest of the collector in the private museum. And, uh, and so you see art that you don't normally see in uh, sort of institutions. And, uh, and so everything's different. The art's different, the way it's displayed, the way it's curated, the setting, the architecture, it's a, a total new experience. And, um, and that's why I thought it'd be worthwhile in my presentation today to talk about some of the private museums in Australia. Um, Absolutely. Have, yeah. have, at it. have at it and also show us some interiors of, of yours if you could as well. Yeah, we've got all that. Yeah, go ahead and tell us a little bit about what you, what you wanted to talk about when it comes to private museums. Uh, well, I can do that. Do you want me to do my slideshow now or? Sure, yeah, let's have a look. Let's do a trip around Australia's uh, private museums. Okay, all right. So that'll, that's quite a um, a unique opportunity. Okay, so uh, I'll start off with uh, the the big one. Uh, this is Mona, the Museum of Old and New Art. This is in Hobart in Tasmania, which is an island off the south uh, south of uh, Melbourne, and. Um, was set up by this uh, guy here called David Walsh. And David Walsh actually makes his money. He's made a fortune out of professional gambling. And um, he's actually a mathematician oh. and a, um, also a uh, digital expert. And he's created all these programs which are no lose. And he's made a fortune. So he's also uh, uh, a great art collector. So um, he built this uh, museum and uh, I think it was uh, in 2004. Um, and it's located on the Derwent River um, in, in actually working class area where he grew up and um, it's built on a winery and so which he runs as well and um, and he's very eccentric and uh, highly opinionated and um, so the whole theme of the um, facility about two great focuses of his which is sex and death and uh, and you can see uh, in some of the artworks here, it's actually the building was cut into the hill there and they use mining equipment to cut out the sandstone to actually create the uh, gallery space. And, um, and, uh, and it's totally disruptive. He sort of broke every rule in the book with regard to putting together museums. And um, yeah, in some it's... ways, uh, going there is like a religious experience. It's like a pilgrimage and you're going down into the a subterranean temple and uh, you can see by the shots here so he has both a sort of um, a very extensive um, uh, antiquity collection and also a contemporary collection of Australian and international art and um, uh, this work here is by uh, Wim Voys, a Belgian artist and this is called Clacker Professional and essentially it is a device for um, uh, converting food into uh, waste, uh, like the human digestive system, and at two o'clock every day, it actually discharges the feces for everyone to see. Um, and he also, <laughs> and up here on the top here, you can see these are uh, 153 vulvas, which are um, plaster casts of women vulvas, which have uh, been uh, put on the wall there. And each one of them is different, which is fascinating. They're like private museums. Uh, they're all unique. And, uh, uh, and you can see just by the, the uh, atmosphere of the uh, uh, museum uh, is just amazing. And, um, and he's also commissioned major artists like uh, James Turrell and other international artists uh, to install. So it is a total experience uh, going to that place. And, um, just an example, in the first uh, three years, he had 4 million visitors. And I think he single-handedly has uh, revolutionized the tourism industry in that state. Um, wow, that sounds fantastic. It's amazing. It is a real international destination. There's another one in Sydney, which is also amazing. This is uh, called White Rabbit. Uh, and it was started by Judith Nielsen. 
And it, its um, distinction is that it's um, the most uh, extensive collection of contemporary Chinese art in the world. Uh, she started collecting in uh, 2000. So it's all art since 2000. And uh, she's got about 2,500 works in her collection. And she has, uh, I think, two or three exhibitions per year. And as you can see, there are major installations by major uh, Chinese artists, many of which are very sort of um, critical of the government. And um, so she converted this uh, Rolls-Royce depot into a sort of four level gallery and, and it's amazing art. We, every time we go to Sydney, we just make a pilgrimage to see it. And she also has a tea house uh, where you can actually have refreshments. Um, Very cool. Very cool. Yeah, and this is one in Victoria, which is about an hour out of Melbourne in uh, the Yarra Valley, which is our wine country. Uh, Australia is very famous for its wine. So not only can you experience art here, but you can also have lunch and wine tastings. So um, this is set up by Mark and Eva Beeson, and um, they started collecting Australians. So their collection is all Australian, um, started collecting from the mid 50s. and. Um, they set up this museum, uh, private museum, and uh, so they have um, exhibitions from their own collection, but also uh, from um, curated exhibitions from art from outside. Uh, they have a Trinali, and um, and the, they also have major uh, installations in the grounds of the um, of the property there, and um, and that is also an amazing destination as well. Um, this one is uh, similar to us. This is a house museum, uh, also by an architect. So Melbourne's got the distinction of having two house museums, each by architects, uh, by uh, Cor Corbett Lyon. And this is um, called the Lyon House Museum. So it's in two parts. The four slides on the left are actually the house. So he has tours of his home, um, which he conducts personally with himself and by his wife. And this was actually the inspiration for us to set up JAM. Um, so you you uh, you live at Jam. It's your yeah yeah. Your, live there. Uh, uh, a house museum is a um, a sort of quite a rarefied version of a private museum where the collector actually lives uh, in the museum, wow. and so the museum has both a private and public function. And that's one of the things that Corbett is doing here, exploring the sort of dichotomy between what's private and what's public. Uh, mm -hmm. And in his case, it's all integrated, but then he went one step further. So in the property next door, he actually built a fully fledged art gallery museum, um, which he calls the uh, uh, House Museum Galleries. And he's got a huge space in there, which he actually has um, um, exhibitions open to the public and people can just walk in off the street and buy a ticket and, um, and see that. Whereas in, with the House Museum, you actually have to book for a small group tour, um, which leads us to Jam. So I'll just show you this video. Uh, so um, with Jam, the focus of Jam was that we wanted to uh, actually provide our, um, our visitors a very personal and intimate experience. So we have small groups, so we're into what's called slow art. So we don't have big exhibitions. And uh, we spend a lot of time. So each, each of our tours lasts about two hours. Um, and we provide refreshments. And, um, and, and we also uh, run the tours uh, in an interactive way. So we engage our audience uh, to actually interrogate the art. And because um, what we find is that a lot of uh, people are intimidated by contemporary art and uh, we want to sort of demystify it. And, um, and, uh, and we have what we sort of like to call like salons or soirees where people come and um, see the art, uh, have a discussion, uh, be intellectually stimulated, have some food and a drink and have a chat to each other. We also have um, architecture taught by some of Australia's top six uh, who I know. And, um, and uh, what, what we found is there's a real hunger for from the public. Uh, many of the people who visit us are not art people in the sense that they are collectors, they're just people who are interested in art. And um, so what we talk about is actually providing an experience rather than actually exhibitions. Um, so uh, as part of our project, we actually commissioned three artists to actually produce work, which was actually integrated into the building. 
So we've got this right panel uh, to the walls of our gallery by an artist called Tony Krauss. And the lift, we appointed uh, an artist uh, called Paul Snell to do this digitized uh, panel to go in the lift. But the biggest commission was this stair, uh, which has uh, got 39 steps. And that's interactive, actually, when you walk up the stairs, every time you uh, trip a sensor, it actually changes the lighting combination, as you would have seen in the video. And the other thing we did is uh, we, we're big fans of Eve Klein Blue. So we've got large slabs of uh, walls painted in Eve Klein Blue, uh, which is a sort of a theme throughout our museum. And um, so we have two, two spaces. We've got the public areas, which are, we've got a gallery space here, and we also have our apartment. So we're over three levels. Um, and with the gallery space, we actually change it. Uh, we're like Mona, we believe uh, we're not into the white box, we're into what we call the theatrical experience. So in this particular case, uh, this exhibition was called Black and White and Red All Over, which I hope you know is the newspaper joke. And uh, so we had all the black and white works from our collection against this blood red wall. And, um, and we also had sub themes. So the theme about this was how we live in a black and white world and how the world is becoming polarized. So there's both a political and also an artistic um, sort of underpinning to what we're looking at. Mm. Um, and this is our apartment. So we change our apartment every time we change an exhibition. So every time people come to our place, they get a total new experience. Uh, these works are from our collection and um, and this is the actual collection that we have on our walls at the moment. Uh, and uh, one of the things that we are committed to is actually unlocking private collections. So we, um, we've had, uh, this is our second exhibition for another private collector. And they've got actually a museum quality collection, two thirds of which is indigenous art. And uh, you can see some of the examples here of indigenous art. And, um, and one of the things we want to explore here is the idea that there is no differentiation between what's indigenous and what's Western style art. They're really part of the same movement. And um, so we've um, commissioned a, um, a writer to write an essay about that. And, uh, but um, this has been postponed. So we'll be living with somebody else's uh, top class collection for two years, which is quite a bonus, I think for us. And uh, so we have a lot of fun. Wow. Uh, and these are some of the artworks from our own collection. So our collection is essentially uh, non-representational. Uh, we're big into abstract art, both hard-edged and um, uh, sort of expressionist art. Uh, we're also big collectors of digital art and videos. And uh, uh, most of it's Australian. Um, and we mainly collect uh, emerging artists. So um, we don't spend a lot of money on our art. Um, some of the artists are really well known, like Daniel Crooks is an internationally renowned video artist and uh, Stephen Bram is uh, collecting all the major museums, but most of our art is actually from young artists who are still either at school or just emerging. And, um, uh, and that's the other thing we're trying to do with our visitors, uh, trying to give them the confidence to buy art um, and it doesn't have to be a named artist uh, because uh, they can actually acquire art as a very cost-effective way and surround themselves with fantastic art uh, and uh, bring joy to their life, um, which is a lot cheaper than buying a handbag for $15,000. That, that's, that's, that's pretty beautiful. That is, a, that is a pretty awesome presentation, Charles. Um, I am, uh, my eyes have been opened and I really appreciate it. Um, I'd like to go back to Roan if you're still there and shows oh, yeah. you know, some of Roan's work. You um, know, uh, Charles, it's really the, it's the immersive experience of, of art museums, you know, it's, uh, it's done in a very interesting immersive way, which kind of ties into Roan's immersive experiences nicely as well. Yeah, yeah. Without, without a doubt. Yeah, like I think that experience, yeah. Yeah, uh, and that's why we ended the, the slideshow with the jam experience, because what, what, what we're promoting is the experience and it's to, the totality. It's not only the art itself, it's actually the experience of being there. It's also the architecture, it's the design, it's the food, it's the discussion, it's the immersion in the idea of art. Because uh, we're be big believers that art is about ideas and uh, it's not about an object sitting on a wall. Uh, and. Um, and therefore, um, there's quite a bit of 
commonality between what Rome is doing because again he's using art as part of the total experience and uh, so uh, it's very much what we're into as well and I think I think, I that's, think, where, I think that's where art's going anyway and I think you can make this the case that Alec over at the art gallery in New South Wales is doing an immersive experience too yeah but now yeah. Uh, now we're now we're here at uh, with Roan's work um Roan talk us through it yeah um myself now like I've you know, gained a huge following in the last uh, few years for doing these immersive experiences as I've been, you know, just talking about where people can come into these buildings or installations that I've built up and walk through them. And um, like for me, oh yeah, well, the almost irony of it that people are so keen to come and see them because everyone that I've done has been destroyed afterwards. So that limited amount of time has kind of made it um, very exclusive. And like I sold tickets for the last event quite cheap, but they all sold out. And then it became like almost a commodity of the ticket became such a valuable thing. And yeah, it's kind of been interesting. Are you saying there was a that. resale of, of the tickets we, themselves? People were selling the actual tickets people, afterwards? Yeah, people were trying and we had to um, yeah, work out ways that people could sell them but not profit on it. Um, and people kind oh, of I see. would call I guess... anyone out. It's like, you, you can't do this. This is extortionary, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> because they're only uh, $15 a ticket and we, you know, there was none left um, for like six weeks of the show. And... Uh, still now people are disappointed they didn't get in um, to the last exhibition, but it just, I learned a lot of lessons doing a, you know, such an exhibition like this, like my staff costs were astronomical and it was, it was actually just a zero sum game uh, to run it. So um, lots of lessons I've learned for the next one. Um, but the whole idea of doing something that, is only their temporary comes from you know street art and my background and we do these things and it's only going to be there for the moment and you put all your effort into it and you you have to make sure you take a photograph of it because you know the next day it may be maybe painted over and for me so like that's what's exciting that. about street art um I was gonna, it's a book. so this is actually this is level uh you're finding um sort of places that are about to be knocked down or ab abandoned places and and yeah. doing an experience in them yeah so this place pictured here um i've got some photos further but it was a uh, an old um giant like uh, art deco hotel um and it hadn't been used for 20 years and the owner basically offered it to me to do something with it. I actually put it into a lot worse state than it looked. So a lot of the mold and rot and stuff like that is, it's all fake. Um, it's actually in a lot better condition than it looks. So I've had buildings offered to me. It's like, I can't actually get public to walk through here because it's too hazardous. So it's a lot easier for me to make something look more, you know, dilapidated than it really is. Um, Cause now, Part of my part of the whole game I'm doing is the logistics of getting people through an experience. Um, I quickly just touch on Melbourne, um, like the street art scene in Melbourne is like I think it's literally like one of the biggest pillars of uh, Victorian tourism, um, and big attraction is this. There's quite a few laneways in Melbourne, and this is the key one, Hosier Lane, and it looks like this pretty much every single day full of tourists and pretty much anyone can pick up a paint can and paint there. Uh, for a lot of established artists like myself who come from this background, like we no longer like to paint there because you paint something and it's gone by the afternoon and uh, you literally have swarms of people around you and it's just, it's not a great experience. And the people who paint there now are often tourists, you know, like if I flew into another city and I knew I could, painted a lane in Paris, I'd probably go do that. But for locals, it's kind of, uh, you know, it's been and gone. Um, and this oh, photo yeah. is the same laneway from the year to 2002, maybe, when when we first started 
painting there. It wasn't um it wasn't allowed at all and you know everything would just get painted over every week or so if you if you um, come, if you come yeah. to venice if you come to venice california sometime we have a wall called the the graffiti art wall that is pretty large and uh, most of the well-known graffiti artists around here have agreed to leave every decent painting up for a week because as you yeah. know as you know, the graffiti yeah. code is if you can't paint something better <laughs> than what's already there, don't do it. Yeah, that's that's right. Yeah. Um, this, this is old Melbourne. Like, this is where it really boomed in the early 2000s, and this is what street art looked like here. But it, it's since grown into uh, the muralism culture, as a lot of people call it, that you see now. Um, I was part of a group called the Everfresh Crew, and we kind of were the first in this area to kind of step away from the traditional letter form graffiti and start doing more street art, but doing it on a scale that was probably competing with more of the graffiti artists. Right. Um, that kind of melded into the muralism. And these are some other artists that are friends of mine and they've started, you know, they've been painting as long as I have and gone on to do some really amazing successful things within Australia and internationally. Um, Adnate just uh, has an entire hotel in Perth actually now, um, literally named the Adnate Hotel. Um, so it's really amazing to see um, such giant commercial ventures uh, be so accepting of uh, street art in Australia, which has been really interesting as well. Um, there's other artists like Callum Preston who I work with a lot um, who've done other things like he comes from a street art background but he's been doing these installations where he'll build everything out of wood like all those zero boxes and stuff are just wood and hand painted and even down to the magazine covers in this milk bar and this was presented inside um, a gallery that people could go in there and you could um, buy the items individually. Oh, cool. um, there's another artist, Mysterious Al, who's actually from the UK, but uh, has lived here for a decade and has been painting since the early 2000s as well. But I've worked with him a lot, um, helping him find uh, empty buildings. And the photograph on the right is actually from an abandoned fish and tackle shop that a developer offered to me and he was looking for a space to hold an exhibition. And this is how he transformed it. Like got in some really good lighting, painted everything black. And um, if you went in there three months before, it was like a, a fishing and bait shop. Um, and you made it look like this. And it's like, there's quite a few artists in Melbourne kind of just, the galleries that offer us opportunities are often artist run galleries and they just don't really have much more to offer that we could possibly do ourselves so for myself that's kind of where the path I've gone down where it's like I've just run my own exhibitions and now we come at a stage where when galleries come to me and they say oh we'd like to represent you which is such a flattering offer and all they can do is say they'll take uh you know 50 60 percent of the wall price of any works that are sold but I've kind of built my business model based on putting 50, 60% into the installation of the work um, based on what I think I could sell. And there's no gallery that would put that amount of money into an installation for me. Um, so I've kind of just done that on my own there. Well, it's more, Ian Strange is uh, from a straight out background. He used to be called Kid Zoom. And he's been doing some incredible work and he worked with the other house museum, um, the Lion Museum recently, uh, did an installation there. But he's done these uh, kind of takeovers of houses and presented them as photography. He did a great series in New Zealand in like uh, in Christchurch after the earthquake. Um, he spent months there uh, painting and cutting giant holes in some of these houses and that was quite an um, amazing series he did. But interesting that he comes from the same kind of uh, school as myself, 
in a way and he's also been like an inspiration now he's actually working at the art gallery of wa um helping do some art direction there uh, for, i don't know the temporary role or he's going to be there for a, a while now because all of his projects have been pushed back as well um well this <laughs> yeah this is your this is yours again or it's another this, this is my artwork this is probably from uh almost eight nine years ago canvas work so when i first kind of transitioned from trying to take my work from the street onto the canvas this is what it looked like um kind of you know pulling in bull, bill posters and textures and noise from the street and um it's always been like that troubling thing like how do you how do you put street art into a gallery that you know it's like it's something that's always challenged me and that's where i've come into this immersive space because street art is an experience like that's what makes it interesting because of the the context um so my recent works where i'm just i'm actually just selling photographs of my works in the context environment that i want them to be in rather than trying to sell the canvas um yeah i think i think you know i think what we have somehow we've constructed oh these are wonderful yeah. these are these are the ones that i was referring to at the beginning um or at least you know this kind of stuff um there's an artist uh um, by the name of John Devola, who was doing things like this and uh, in the 70s, but not like not nothing like what you're doing, but the, the feeling of being both inside and outside at the same time. Yeah, is is a is a is a wonderful um, thing. Um, I'd like to move on and, yeah. and Ron, thank you very much for this no thing. I think what we've done here is we've we've discovered something, at least I have about Australian the, pro the proclivities of the Australian art world in terms of experience, which I think is going on around the world, of course, and even more so now. Um, we were gonna do some studio visits, right, Om? Om? Uh, you're muted. Uh, I can't hear you. Oh, yeah, there sorry. You there you go. So we're going to do some studio visits where we yeah, but uh, I, I want to explore a little bit uh, yeah, of uh, we can discuss any similarities we've seen here and um, what I'm seeing a lot of is um, uh, pushing the, the modalities a lot like with Rowan there's um, uh, it's a painting but it's but it's an installation but it's street art at the same time um, Alec has a, a uh, public uh, museum that's also an uh, artist studio foundation. Uh, the artist himself, Brett Whiteley, uh, combined a lot, of, a lot of things in a very cohesive way within his paintings, but also had a, um, uh, cheers, Rowan. Thanks for Thanks, staying. Thanks, Rowan. Thanks, man. Yeah. <laughs> very nice to get to know you a little bit. Um, uh, to have that studio above a museum like that just shows, you know, the, the, a lot of um, kind of left left and right brain crossover um, in, in a lot of the things I'm seeing. Um, and then uh, Charles's museum that you have steps up, that you walk up and they interact with you and um, it's an experience. I've never seen that. A lot of the private museums seem to be extensions of the collector's personality, which is um, the space themselves seen that way. Whereas uh, a lot of the private museums I've seen here, it's more uh, white box and uh, the art is, a, is uh, the collector's personality, but uh, not as much uh, uh, as, as what I saw there. Um, so that was exciting. Yeah, I, I totally get that. I mean, I'm my eyes are opened in terms of this immersive feeling, and uh, it's a uh, it it you know it reminds me of why certain museums have always been so attractive to me, especially the smaller ones. 
if you like in Paris, some of the very smaller, smallest museums that are converted from other, from homes and stuff like that. Those are the ones that, you know, like, um, I forget the German name for it, but they used to, they used to, they, they were back in, you know, hundreds of years ago, they were basically a studiola in the, the Italian word is studiola, where you built your studio in, in your palazzo to house all the things you collected and brought your friends over to show them how cool it was. That's really what's exciting about seeing what you guys are doing because it has that element of, um, or, of like, of the ability to, to, to put things on the wall and juxtapose things that aren't necessarily always put together so that you can see more about the work because you've got so much difference between what you're putting next to each other. And that's, that's part of that. And also just being able to see what someone likes to keep around and the, the atmosphere they like to provide for people who visit them. And uh, that's really cool. Yes, Alec. Um, I just, can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Okay. I just wanted to uh, share the idea that um, with the Studio Museum as it is today, where we, we're, we're limited with it being in a residential area and passing traffic, it's not a, a tourist built purpose museum. It's actually uh, in a residential area where Whiteley lived. And so for that intimacy and that uh, scale, it, it's about the quality of the experience over the volume of, of traffic or people coming to visit us. And so there's a lovely balance of having the intimacy of people being able to sit with works quietly and enjoy that experience combining that with other public programs, we do drawing classes or other things here. But then um, because we're uh, a satellite of the Art Gallery of New South Wales, we can take works on the road and take them to regional venues and promote Whiteley's works. And incidentally, the studio exists if you visit Sydney. And it's a way of creating new audiences over a longer period of time. Uh, and I think that's another thing that studios have to offer or studio museums have to offer is it's an intimate experience. It's a, it's a personal uh, journey. Exactly. Um, so how are we doing these studio visits? Um, is, is Laura? Doing yeah, that? well, uh, yeah. So what we'll do is um, we have a selection of, you know, it's a virtual tour. So as you go and travel to a country, you might, get the opportunity to pop into some uh, local artist studios. Um, uh, so I'll get, uh, Laura's got a collection of all the works up uh, and we'll look at that and then uh, call upon the artists and pop into their studio if they happen to be on. Are you um, able to bring it up, Laura? Okay. So this first guy, Jordan, is a, um, uh, do you mind paging down a little, uh, Lauren? Uh, okay, just actually just slowly uh, roll, roll down and, and I'll, um, okay. Is uh, Josh Rosenthal on at all? Okay. Um, Laura, what I'll get you to do is just click on each image and we'll make it bigger and I'll just, I'll just say a little something about the artist and then, uh, and then we'll, we'll call upon them if they're here. So Jordan uh, uh, Zoom is a, a Brisbane artist. These are actually encaustic. Um, he, he has a solo show tomorrow, so he couldn't be on here. But they're, they're encaustic, and those holes are like uh, dug into the painting. So you see lots of layers of the encaustic, which is cool. So we'll just move to the next artist now. It's another Jordan piece. Tom, you're on, I think. Can we pop into your studio? Yeah, actually, guys, I'm... Um... I don't have a studio at the moment because, oh. yeah, I'm, I'm house sitting down in LA. Uh, oh, no worries. Yeah, Just tell the, us a bit about this, uh, this interesting work here. Sure. So first I wanted to say I've been to the Brett Whiteley Gallery. I'm from Melbourne, um, but I used to go up to Sydney a bit and I've had 
it's an incredible place. Um, and yeah, what, uh, what um, Alec was saying about the intimacy of the place, I just want to say, you know, the bit where you're looking at the doors, the two doors with all the pictures on it, uh, it has pictures of Bob Dylan and all this stuff. And it really stayed with me spending time in that space and seeing the stuff that Brett had on his walls. I, I'm a big fan of his. And um, as uh, and I want to go to uh, Charles's museum as well. I, I, yeah, haven't been to Australia for a bit, but uh, next time I definitely will. Um, yeah, and I don't, I'm, I don't have students. I'm doing a school up at, I'm doing an MFA up at Santa Barbara uh, University of California, but we've, they've just closed the studios because of COVID. So I came back down to LA for a while. Um, okay. Anyway, yeah. So this painting here, I do a lot of, um, yeah, there's sort of free form kind of improvised figurative paintings. And they're all from a series called Floating Downstream. And they're very much about, this one kind of literally references a sort of downstream experience. Uh, but there's a lot of figures. It sort of borrows its name from the John Lennon lyrics um, about referencing coming up on an acid trip. So they're very, I'm into sort of psychedelia and um, cool. kind of implied well, narrative works, yeah. I can see a bit of Arthur Boyd in there maybe too, or, or hey, James Gleason or- uh, Oh, you've done your, you've uh, done your uh, homework. Of the artist. Yeah, I'll, I'll take no, that. No, uh, just, uh, just, just by looking at it, I was seeing that. Uh, um, yeah. All right, um, yeah, no, I definitely grew up on, on that stuff. Like I went to school, I went to VCA in Melbourne and I did, um, a year of honours at uh, Monash as well. And I sort of grew up, when I was at art school, I had to, you know, my sort of mentor and a, a teacher that really affected me was uh, Steve Cox, an Australian painter who remains a good friend. Um, and I sort of benefited from, there's a sort of school of Australian painting with like Gareth Sansom and the people he taught. So I used to have a studio with uh, Peter Walsh in Melbourne and some of those. Yeah, that's kind of an older painting there. Um, did you have that other one that was on the uh, wall earlier? Because there's one uh, I want to talk is, about. Um, uh, Laura, do you mind cutting back to that grouping we had? Yeah, that very first page, if you have it, because there's one that specifically references Australia, I was going to mention. Um, oh, the. Thank you. Yeah. There we go. Yeah, this one. I, was, I wanted to talk about this one because this is uh, people from Australia will remember the show Mr. Squiggle. Um, huh. There he is in the bottom right. Yeah, yeah. So <laughs> Mr. Squiggle was a children's show when I was growing up in Australia where children would send in pictures of squiggles. And Mr. Squiggle was a puppet. He had a pencil for a nose and he was from outer space. He'd come down in a rocket. Uh, Jane would hold his hand and he would he would draw on the squiggles and uh, turn them into a sort of picture, usually upside down. He had a grumpy chalk uh, backboard that he would use. And um, and I was sort of, it was, I did this one recently and I was painting, because like I said, the works are very improvised and sort of figuring out content as I go along and obviously introducing content as I feel it relates to it. But I was really thinking about how formative Mr. Squiggle was for me watching that as a kid and how it's kind of not dissimilar to how I work. So it's a bit of a homage to uh, Mr. Squiggle. Uh, it was like a, and we had an ABC in Australia, you know, Australian Broadcasting Corporation. And yeah, we sort of grew up on, it was a That's good great. show. Yeah, I, re, I rewatched yeah. some of YouTube recently and it holds up, it's a good show. That's good. Ties into the Aussie theme tonight yeah. too. Um, yeah, that's bringing back memories. Uh, yeah. <laughs> he yeah. draws, if you guys can see, I don't know if anyone, but he has a, a pencil for his nose and he draws and uh, people interpret it. Yeah. That's it, great. It, yeah, it was only as an adult when I rewatched it on YouTube that I realised that, you know, the puppeteer is above it holding, because he's got a very pointy hat and the puppeteer is holding the hat and drawing upside from so yeah all right let's switch back and uh pop into psychedelic very psychedelic yeah 
I like that. Yeah. I mean, um, uh, Laura, do you mind popping back to the main screen? Yeah. And Tara, Tara is on, so uh, we'll maybe pop in on Tara. Uh, there, Hi, there, guys. She is. there she is on the right. <laughs> yeah. So Tara, Tara is in the studio, right? Yeah, let's pop over to Tara's studio. Or... Hi, guys. Hey. Thanks for visiting. Um, I'd like to begin by uh, doing something we do in Australia, which is acknowledging the traditional owners of the land. And where I am in um, the Bay Area, it's the Ohlone people. I was born in Ireland and grew up in Australia, and now I'm living in the US in the Bay Area. Um, and I'm soon, I'm gonna have a home in Santa Monica. So I'm thrilled about that. Oh, that's fantastic, close by. Yeah. Um, yeah, I came and visited uh, your gallery a few weeks ago. I love the show that you have on up at the moment. Thank you. Um, so I started my art career in New York and I also ran an experimental exhibition space there and worked as a curator for No Longer Empty and, the, and also worked at the Chelsea Art Museum. And currently I'm the director of the Augusta Savage Fellowship and we provide subsidized studio space to people identifying as black, indigenous and artists of color. So that's what wow. I've been working on uh, whilst in COVID and also working in my studio when I can, but it was closed for a lot of the time too. And it's in this, um, it's in this very strange old school and it was kind of a bit like the zombie apocalypse for a while. It was, it was very strange. Uh, are, you t are, t are you talking about the Bay Area now? Yeah. <laughs> what part? Uh, so I'm, uh, I'm at a place called Cubbly in Palo Alto. It's a studio program run by the city and it's, um, they provide subsidized studio space to artists and um, we get juried in and we're here for four years or eight years, depending on um, how much kind of community work you do. Uh, That's, so pretty, it's, that's pretty great. Yeah. It's fantastic. Um, Can you show us around your studio or are you on sure. your- Sure, yeah, totally. Um, so the, my current series, I'm dealing with issues of environmental justice and uh, specifically um, the use of single use plastic. And I try and um, elevate plastic as a medium. So here we have, um, here, let me turn my screen around actually. Um, so this is uh, single-use plastic wrapped around some lights and um, I'm trying to have a zero-waste studio so I'm sequestering plastic into my works too. And this one here, this represents a, um, a uh, these, these concrete forms. Here, I'll show you this, this one first. These concrete forms... I put styrofoam in them and I collect this from my neighbors and um, on next door and the soft plastics as well. And these little interventions I do with my community um, help them think about their waste and their decision decisions about the things that they purchase too. Uh, so this is my first sculptural series. Previously, I've worked in photography, collage, and video. Those and are cool. it's very interesting. It's yeah, it's fantastic. It's, they're, they're cool. They're they're like a little bit of James Terrell and a little bit of George George Herms. Right, and, and also also Earth. some Dan Flavin the, thrown the, in there too. That's what I meant. Yeah, the earlier guy. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, and yeah. this. This piece here, this uh, uh, represents a core sample and it's kind of the story of the earth represented by core samples. And so you see the various geological striations and then we get to um, the current era, which I'm calling the Plasticine. And this is, I collect these with the Surf Rider Foundation on the beaches and I put them into my works. 
and then um, these have all, all sorts of plastics that I collect and I call it sort of like sequestering. Oh, Maya. So how do you, that, that's something that um, is really interesting to me is the collection of disparate materials and how you make them stick together. Um, yeah. Yeah, so really, I start out kind of I start out with this stuff. So my screen's going nuts. And then um and then I wrap I wrap it around I wrap it around these light tubes and then I just, just kind of do a little bit of magic to make it look nice. Um but yeah, it's all it was all it's all very much um trial and error. Um which is kind of the the fun part, especially because I haven't. I my career didn't start out as a sculptor, so it's very much just kind of making it up as I go along. Um, so, and that's the fun thing to come into the studio and and see uh, what's transpired. What's because it's because um, I start out off with the. Um, with the uh, cement pieces, they start off with the formwork, and then you don't really know what's going to happen with them, and then they en they end up having these amazing textures. Very very cool. Oh, wait, wait. Very cool. And then this is uh, this I I got my uh, eight year old neighbor to make me this origami box, which I then. Uh, kind of crushed and made into this light fixture. So I'm just kind of playing around with lots of, and this was just some paper that another artist left in the studio. So I'm just, I'm, I'm just, I find the material and then I work out what to do with it. Um, so that's kind of the fun so part it, of that. So it's a bit of, it's, it's a lot of scavenging. Yeah, there's a lot of scavenging, but it's a lot of, you know, recycled art can kind of look like trash. So I'm, I'm trying to make it look as um, as elegant as it possibly can while still, you know, retaining some of its initial charm. Yeah, the theme, the theme through a lot of this stuff seems to be recurring in terms of the core sample aspect of it and the building, the layers, according to what came before and what came after and Sometimes it all comes at the same time, but the, the the element of time in in the element of time and compression of time in the pieces is really really nice. Um, and of course, they have the because the tall skinny ones have a feel of like totem feels to them, a little bit of a totem feel. So you're you're definitely addressing temporal temporal ideas very much so in the work. And I think. Um just using minimalist forms because I feel like I, it, it's you know to me this is all new and I uh, I love I love those minimalist um, sculptures anyway like I've been out to Marfa and and seen the works of uh, Donald Judd and Dan Flavin and and I I just I, I think it's a really nice place to start from because the the material that I'm using is so busy and uh, crazy that to 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 kind of like bring it down to something that's so minimal is kind of important at least in this stage of my development anyway very very cool very cool excellent um laura just put on a, a the last couple of images there and we'll see if uh, josh is on but I, I don't think he is and then we can just have a uh, open discussion for a little bit, a couple yeah, of questions, Alex, and then... Yeah, yeah sorry to interrupt. Alex, 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 something you wanted to say. Yes, yes. I'm sorry, I have to leave. Um, oh, yeah, but I just absolutely. wanted to thank you very much for the opportunity, and it's been fascinating to see all the artists, Tara and Tom, and uh, to others, and J Charles in Melbourne, um, get safe and uh, can't wait to get down there and have a look at the uh, the museum that you have. Yuri and Om, thank you very much for your time. Appreciate it. It's so Absolutely much pleasure. It's honoured to have you in and, and uh, appreciate it. I can't Please. wait to come see the work. Please do. Great. So, uh, 
yeah, I'll just get big on those Josh Rosenthal for a second. Just to have another taste of Australian art. Um, and uh, you can see a bit of uh, Brett Whiteley and his work for sure. Um, and uh, touch of Francis Bacon too. So it was interesting to hear that those two were uh, um, uh, good friends. Yeah, it is interesting. Yeah, it is interesting. I mean, this is part of the, this is what the fun part of this process is <clears throat> in doing these art world shows is that you find connections that you uh, don't, uh, didn't, didn't know about, um, you know, <clears throat> Um, you, you just, you know, it, it's just fascinating to see where people come from and where they go. And, um, and you know, no matter what country you live in, you tend to uh, believe that, you know, your world is And this is what's great about the series is that it allows us to open our minds a little bit and, and look beyond Absolutely. Our, our own in, our own environments and get immersed in other people's environments. Absolutely, yeah. And each country we've been to has had a slightly different flavor to it, and definitely seeing things. Um, it makes you wonder, you know, if certain certain artists had um, become part of the world canon, how the you know the the mainstream art world might have. Uh, evolved differently uh, uh, so yeah it's been fascinating to see yeah so, and, uh, are we are we i mean i know we've been running a little over but should we open it up to uh some questions yeah yeah i'd love to yeah we just have open discussion amongst ourselves and, and uh, any guests that are still on uh and uh, uh Tom, any really questions like yeah, sorry, I'm interrupting. I apologize. I'm excited about it. Tom, I really like your work. Yeah. Tom, Tom Dunn, your work is great. He may not be on. I'm looking at him, but he's not. <laughs> oh, maybe he's on. I don't know if he's really, if he heard me, but I really okay. like your work. Anyway, anybody have any questions? Sorry, I just lost connection there for a second. Did I miss? I was just complimenting on you, you on your work. Oh, thank you so much. I'm sorry. As soon as it went from that screen share to this, I lost uh, connection for a second. So, uh, sorry about that. Thank you. That's nice. No, no, you. I, I really like like, I'm gonna the first thing I'm gonna do after we're done with this is I'm gonna go look at Mr. Squiggle, and I'm gonna. Yeah. Study oh, you got it. Yeah. I'm, I'm gonna study your work because. Um, the idea of having, you know, a puppeteer control something that's based on a squiggle that somebody sent in is really, is really a, a great. Um, it's it's concept. as classic as like Pee Wee Herman in terms of like artistic kids show. Uh, I think that, that's a great comparison actually for Australia. It's like a, yeah, I like that. And also a little bit of Ziggy Stardust in there, I think with Mr. Squiggle. I always found anyway. Um, yeah. Yeah, we had we had HR Puff and stuff, which was kind of like our version of psychedelia during the 70s. Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, it was uh the guys who who made it were clearly under the influence. And that was really what was wonderful about it, because it was sanctioned by a major, you know, and anytime you do an animation, anybody at Disney or anybody at Warner Brothers or any of the other, Anna Barbera, whatever, any of the uh, animation studios knows that animators are a crazy bunch. They're, you know, they're about squiggles big time. Um, so oh, I, I, I should have mentioned too, uh, since this is going to be on YouTube, if you go to artworldtravelguide.com, there will be a list of all the, the panelists and a link to. Um, seeing uh the artwork that from the studios as well yeah and and uh as far as uh the venice the Ven the bg gallery has always been one of my favorites for years and years and years i've shown there a bunch of times thankfully and uh om and i've been collaborating for quite a number of years and bringing art from other countries and 
doing stuff. And I'm really proud to be a part of this uh, project, this art world project. And uh, if you want to know anything about uh, Southern California artists in general, uh, you can always go to Venice, veniceica.org, which is the Venice Institute of Contemporary Art and check out stuff and <clears throat> get in touch with us because uh, we are, um, we're interested in hearing from folks with, uh, with ideas. So um, is it time to sign off? Uh, well, yeah, is there any questions? Uh, we didn't give anyone a chance really, just unmute yourself. Yeah, yeah, Laura, does anybody have any questions? So okay. um, do you represent Australian artists as well? Yes. I didn't hear, I didn't see who it was from, but uh, uh, Charles. Charles. Oh, hi, Charles. Hi. Uh, uh, yes. Um, but, you know, that's one of the motivations of doing this is getting uh, more in touch with um, uh, um, it's uh, a lot of ex expatriated Australian artists that I work with, a um, uh, few in Australia, but um, uh, wanting to get more into it. It's, um, we've had a Southern California focus at the gallery for the last uh, a few years. So I want to get back into Australian art. Yeah, and uh, one of the things, one of the things we've done that I did in, col in collaboration with the BG Gallery is we brought art from Estonia and we brought art from Japan. Um, to the BG Gallery for a show. What was the name of that show? Edge. What was? What did we call it? Edge to Edge, or was something like that? I don't remember the name of the show. But um, when my gallery was in limbo, or I was moving from one gallery to another, B, um, Ohm uh, invited me to curate with him a show in his gallery in Santa Monica. And we had art from Japan and art from Estonia, and and Ohm always has uh, an international flavor to his shows. Um, and so I think, you know, part of what's wonderful about being in Southern California is we, we are, a, I hate to use a cliche, but it's true. It's a melting pot for cultures from all around the world. And um, we need to do more of, more expansion. We need to expand our, our, conne our connection to and observation of and focus on outward as opposed to just inward. Um, in terms of bringing people together, you go further out, you bring people closer, kind of a thing. Absolutely, yeah. Um, yeah, so. Uh, well, uh, oh, thank you. And thank, Charles, thank you very much. And Tara, thank, thank you, you, Charles. That was uh, oh, great. Uh, I can't wait to go and have that experience next time I'm in Australia. <laughs> yeah, that slideshow that you put together, Charles, was amazing on those private museums. I'm going to have to digest that. And Tom, thanks for your work. Tara, thanks for your work. And thanks Thank for all of guys. our audience for showing up. Um, our next one is what, uh, November 11th? Yes, so we're going to Mexico. Yeah, we go to Mexico so. on November 11th, which is probably going to be uh, Mexico City is kind of the same time zone as ours, so it might be in the middle of the night for some of you, but we would love if you, if you, if you would come visit us in Mexico on November 11th. Uh, depending on what happens in the election, it might get postponed one week, but uh, <laughs> I'm kidding, I'm kidding. But we're, uh, we're excited for you to come visit us again on Art World. And uh, thank you for all the people in Australia for helping us out with this and all the people who are expats and living in the United States or wherever for helping us out. And Om, thank you for the opportunity. I appreciate it. Yeah, thank cheers. you very much. And this, uh, in Australia, cheers. cheers thank everybody. you. <laughs> Take care, cheers, everybody. Guys. Thanks Brown. so much. <laughs> Thanks.